I'm doing your great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop so I can come down to you? That is a great work from 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, as discussed in the Bible and the book of Nehemiah. Let's discuss how this continues to affect the region and the U.S. and national security today here on the Great Work Podcast. All right, welcome back. Great Work Podcast episode. I don't know what episode this is, but today is Monday, August 12th. And I'm. this is going to be a quickie today because honestly, I'm already burnt out on U.S. politics. Notably, tonight we might see a response from Iran and Hezbollah. They'll either be a combined attack or Iran will attack first or Hezbollah will attack first. I've seen so many conflicting reports. I don't know what's going to happen and I don't even know if it will happen tonight. However, Iran did issue a NOTAM or notification not to fly over their airspace from last night to Thursday, I believe. Um, and today is a very important Jewish holiday. It's a mourning, like sad holiday, um, mourning the destruction of the temple, the first and second temples. So if Iran was going, they usually like to wait for holidays, right? Usually they wait for Shabbat, but now they might be waiting uh, or they might be doing it today. Really great guys. They are, aren't they? So we might be seeing a response. I, I honestly don't know. To me, it has seemed like they seem deterred. It seems like there will be some sort of response. I don't, I've never said that they won't respond, but to me, I don't think, I just, I think that they're preservationalist enough not to not to respond in like an in an escalatory manner the rules of engagement have shifted obviously after their april attacks so they do anything up to 300 like combined drones and missiles ballistic and cru cruise missiles you know that's kind of been seen as like an acceptable thing um and we've already had We've already heard that Jordan will intercept those, Saudi Arabia, um, UAE, Bahrain. So we know that some of these would be intercepted and um, kind of taken care of. Um, so there's that, that we might see that happen. We might not. I don't know. Um, something coming from Hezbollah. Last night, Hezbollah did, uh, I think, like 20 to 30 um, rocket fire rockets fired at like um, the north of Israel on the coast, um, north of Haifa. So, um, those are not evacuated areas. So that was a big deal that they launched at those. However, nobody thinks that that was the official response to the assassination in Daya, Beirut from two weeks ago. So I don't, we'll, we'll see, I guess. I don't know. I think a couple of those rockets got through and but I, I have not seen any reports of casualties or even injuries, but I don't think the Iron Dome stopped all of them. And the Pallies are freaking out on Twitter, which is just like, I don't even know why Hezbollah at this point launches rockets because they clearly don't want to escalate, at least by my um, interpretations. And their, their brigade on Twitter and TikTok will run and say whatever they want anyways. So why even risk the escalation, right? I guess, I guess people like to see things go boom, but you know, I don't think that they'll like the consequences of watching those things go boom in Israel. So we'll see. I don't know. I mean, a lot of the reporting coming out of the Middle East right now is just like all over the place. There were reports a couple days ago that Yaya Sinwar wanted to reach a deal and that was reported by Israeli Channel 12. Well, now they, they didn't even send a, a, a delegation to the hostage negotiations that were um, endorsed by Bibi Netanyahu and, you know, America, Egypt, and Qatar put out a statement, like, blessing them as well. So really, it was only Hamas that needed to, like, approve them, and they won't even send a delegation. Biden clearly wants this wrapped up by April 15th. I think he wants this done by the DNC. So we'll see. And, you know, what worse time for there to be a, a breakout in conflict in the Middle East than the DNC because Democrats, a lot, most Democrats support Israel, but that small vocal minority man, man, do they, man, do they not support any sort of thing happening in the Middle East? So we are going to just keep an eye on that. I don't know. Maybe we'll see something. Maybe we won't. I feel like I've said like 12 times, like, oh, we might get a response. So whatever. Um, and then I guess my thoughts on U.S. politics, like, look, I'm already burnt out. I'm already burnt out and it's freaking mid-August. I think that people are fundamentally misreporting what's going on with the numbers right now. Over the weekend, we saw like just the most dumb thing ever of like, oh, crowd size. We're, we're on crowd size again, people. And then the AI thing. And listen, I'm, 
I've seen some of the photos that have come out. They they look like AI. It is not a winning message for Trump to be yelling about AI. And now tonight, Monday night, he's doing some Twitter launch, a uh, Twitter X space with Elon Musk. It reminds me of the failed DeSantis launch where the the space crashed a bunch of times and I think he was trying to, oh, we broke the internet. Well, it was a fail, just like his entire campaign. I'm sorry to say I like Ron DeSantis a lot. That campaign was a massive failure. So I don't know what I think and what I feel about all of this stuff. I don't know. Um, I guess it's just, it's getting annoying. J.D. Vance did really, really, really well on the morning shows. Um, exceptionally well. It's funny that all of the Democrats... I My favorite thing lately is that Democrats on Twitter will be like, wow, this press conference is awful. He's just the wo- most unhinged he's ever been. They'll never link or show a video to the press conference, though, because Trump sounds pretty good at the press conference. So they everything, everything they say about him is, oh, he's just terrible and extreme. And same with J.D. Vance. Oh, he just, he did a terrible job on the morning shows. I watched them. I'm mad at myself that I almost fell for this, like, media hype that J.D. Vance is, like, the worst VP ever. I know he has low approvals, but he's, like, the only candidate that can, like, handle these interviews right now. He was, like, working his way around Dana Bash, being, like, he can, like, pivot the question back to what's important super easily. I mean... I don't know. I mean, he's his IQ is a standard deviation off from like anybody else he's talking to, I bet. So that probably helps. But I think that J.D. Vance was doing a pretty good job at those. And I think like, look, I like I said, I think that this race is being fundamentally misreported. Polls now show Kamala with a narrow lead, um, public polls. Now, if you listen to Dems that are in the know, Dem strategists that are in the know, like on MSNBC and CNN, like Van Jones or David Axelrod, they are saying that the polls, the internal polls, have Kamala even. And I think that that's probably right. I think that that's probably true. I think she clearly has the momentum right now. I think it is starting to piss people off that she's not doing interviews and that she's not, she won't um fully accept all of the debates that trump proposed um i think she's only accepted one maybe that changes because trump obviously backed out and then went back in so they're going to dance around with that for a little bit but i think that it's interesting the way this is all being presented kamala stealing trump's policy she has not put out a policy position that's another thing that i'm looking at democrats and i'm just like guys how i know you all like I know one of the reasons I'm burnt out right now is because it gets so partisan and Republicans are like, you know, all the polls are fake. It's all AI and and Trump's going to win, you know, 400 electoral votes. And then Democrats are like, Kamala's winning 400 electoral votes. Texas and Florida are flipping blue. Nobody, like, like, Trump bad. Like, why on earth would Kamala ever do a single media interview? Or why would she ever do, like, put a platform out? That's ridiculous to put a platform out before the convention. And it's like, what are you talking about? Like, the partisan points are just, like, so mind-numbingly stupid. I... I like can't handle it. But anyways, I think that like I think that they're polling about even and I think I think Dems I'm starting to notice them get worried about like okay, well she probably should do some sort of media interview mainly because let me just tell you, it's so frustrating to me as like as somebody who's not a democrat, right? I Biden clearly had some mental capability problems for the last few years. We don't know how bad they were. I don't know that we'll ever know how bad they were, right? But the media after that interview where the emperor's clothes were off and everybody saw what we all saw, everybody got uncomfortable. Everybody was concerned. And media people started coming out saying, oh, I knew he was this bad six months ago when he couldn't recognize me and I'd covered him and his family at length before, but I never said anything because I didn't want, you know, I didn't want to piss them off. That's wrong. The media is supposed to be adversarial. Right now, they're clearly giving Kamala her like shining moment. But would you rather have an emperor's clothes come off moment in mid-August or late July? Or October, September. I guess early voting starts and Dems will vote early a lot, as will Republicans. But still, undecided holdouts who don't vote early, that's a big, big deal. The press can't just, oh, well, whatever, you know? That's not how that should work. 
So like, Dems spin zoning that is really, really crazy to me. Like you need to be checking your candidate. Even if you support her, look, look at the end of the day, even if, even if you support her, you should want to make sure that she can like handle these tough interviews and stuff because we don't want her to look stupid for four years. And also for me, I am a, not a Democrat. I would never vote for her. I would never vote for Tim Walls ever in my life. Seriously, it, it, it's just, it disgusts me. But I want to know what that platform looks like because she might be my president. Even though she will never earn my vote, she might be my president. And I have a right to know what the country would look like under her. I know what it looks like under Biden. I don't love it. I can live with it, right? But this whole thing of like, well, the platform, like then she's going to get torn apart by her base and Republican. So why put it out? Because that's what you do when you're a political candidate. It's the least she could do. That's like, if you want somebody's vote, the least you can do is try to earn it. It's unfathomable to me that she doesn't do that. So we've got all of that going on too. I don't know. I, I just, I think that this is being, it's funny, like both Republicans and Democrats, I think are like either overconfident or under, it's like a weird thing. If I'm going to put my thoughts into this, I mean, with Trump, people, oh my God, he just doesn't even want to win. Look, Trump always surged late in the polls in both 2016 and 2020. He did much better. His polls were looking a lot tighter in October, November than they were in the summer. I think at this time, August of 2020, Biden was up eight points in swing states. Hillary was up like eight too. She basically took the month of August off from campaigning, which is interesting because that's kind of what Trump's doing. Um, you know, I think Trump kind of knows that the polls will narrow in his favor. And for the Republicans saying like, oh my God, it's just, it's over. The campaign before Biden dropped out was an un insane. The polls didn't shift because of Trump. Although I don't like how he's handling some things right now. They shifted because Biden dropped out. Biden was a senile candidate. His one big, the big concern people had were a lot of his policies, but also that he was just too old. Once you saw him at that, at that debate, all he looked like was old. Nobody was going to be able to unsee that. So they had to get rid of him. That's why we started seeing Trump up six. Trump's not back to even now because of him. The Dems are back to even now because of what they did. Kamala was like one of the most unfavorable vice presidents in history, and she's had a 15-point swing her direction. If anything, I've never heard of a campaign in my life that never goes through bumps, okay? That never, that just goes, continues to go up and up and up and up and up. I've never heard of, that's not a thing, okay? Her numbers will eventually come, they'll e come back down. If the top, if her top is polling even with Trump, that's not a phenomenal position for Democrats to be in, right? Doesn't mean that they're going to lose, but it's not great, right? Before she's ever come under any scrutiny, she's polling two points ahead, which is still within the margin of error or even. Again, we've seen, if anything, her numbers can swing dramatically, when normally they wouldn't swing that dramatically. So, you know, like it, it, this doesn't mean that it's just like completely over for Trump. And I think right now, if I had to guess his strategy, and I don't know if this is one that's going to work, but right now the media is just not checking her really. Like th maybe they'll start to this week if she really like doubles down on like no platform, no interviews, you know, whatever. Because I can tell like Dana Bash was like, well, we're reaching out. Like you're not going to get a, a pushback from me when J.D. Vance talked about that. So I don't know. But maybe that all shifts. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe her numbers start to taper off. I don't know. And still, in a lot of the polls they're releasing, they're like D plus six polls, sample sizes. And Kamala's only up four. So it's like... How again is this? And then you look at the, you look like the top lines are bad for Trump, but then you look at the cross tabs and it's like, they're assuming a 53% white electorate. Nobody believes the electorate's only going to be 53% white. Every, it's going to be at least 60%. Trump polls better with white voters. So it's like these things, like they don't fundamentally make sense. I'm not saying that every poll is wrong. I'm saying that the polls that they're talking about, like, don't seem to be fully accurate. I, 
I don't know. Or they could spell trouble for Kamala. And again, that does not mean that Trump is winning in a landslide or should is positioned to do such. It means that the media hype and stuff, I just, I don't fully buy into it being as good for Kamala as they're saying it is. But I don't know. To me, when people are saying like Trump's just an idiot, I mean, I don't know. He went up to Montana. He said one comment that he like I think was kind of like rude about John Tester being fat or something he attended like out in the west I think he did a couple fundraisers where he raised a ton of money I think that they have about even cash on hand right now when people are talking about Trump not buying ads I looked at something that he's he spent a ton on ads and like especially RIP Pennsylvania voters right I mean I think it's like Trump's got $50.1 million booked from September to November, and Kamala has like $38 million or something booked. So that's over a hundred, that's a hundred million dollars in ads in just Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is the new Florida. I'm so sorry to Pennsylvania voters. I don't know. I think that, I don't know. I'd like to see where he, and it, it seems like Trump is just doubling down on new media because legacy media is so in the bag for Kamala right now. Maybe, again, maybe that shifts. But then again, too, like we just saw Kamala stole Trump's main, her one policy position she's come out with, I guess, is um, being anti or no taxes on tips, which is funny because I believe she voted against a bill that like had something to do with that. I hope Trump doubles down on it. I would love for him to get rid of the self-employment tax because that kills me. But Trump, like, I'm sorry, but like candidates that are polled and projected to win in a landslide do not steal policy positions from their opponents that are projected to lose in a landslide. That's not a thing. That doesn't happen. Okay. So like anecdotally here, it just, the, the illusion of a Kamala landslide or like easy Kamala victory to me, it is an illusion. One more thing I'll say on this. I've been listening to Mark Halpern every day or a lot of days, I would recommend listening. It's like a live show on YouTube. You can go up on there. Maybe I'll go up one day, but I would, I would recommend people listening. And it's, it's kind of nice. Cause it's like, you hear Republicans, you hear Democrats and kind of their perspective. You'll have like today, like Pat McCrory, who was like the former governor of North Carolina went on Republican. Sean Spicer is usually on, who was the former press secretary of Trump. If you want to hear a funny story actually about Sean's, should I tell this? I'm going to tell this. I don't care. So when I was the chair of Minnesota College Republicans, we had a retreat in Washington, D.C. right before the election. It was like a couple months. It was in August. It was right after my 21st birthday, I remember. And so we had a bunch of like RNC people speak to us about like, here's what to do. Because it was like the... I was the Federation of Minnesota College Republican chair. So there were like all of the... Like the... All of the different states went to this thing or like all of us were invited not every state went it was just like kind of a time for us all to like meet and like kind of party and then get some training on what would happen and the first speaker of the day was a man named sean spicer who i had never heard of before and he was at the time the director of the republican national committee so sean spicer is like talking to i remember i like whipped out my phone to follow him on twitter and was offended when he didn't follow me back like that's how little i knew like that's how I didn't even know about him, right? Because I was like, well, normally political people follow each other back. Why wouldn't he? And like, he's just such a bigger deal than me. But like, maybe that says something bad about me. But it it more says something about like, that's how like, I just, nobody knew who he was or I didn't. Only operatives knew. And he said something to us. He goes like, he was talking about like how to message around like being a Republican on campus and stuff. Because if you remember back in 2016, there was a problem where like Republican chapters at like Harvard or somewhere like college Republicans would put out a statement saying that they wouldn't endorse Trump and the media would eat it up because the media was like trying to come up with this narrative of like zero Republicans support him. And so we were trying to figure out like, okay, if that happens with one of your chapters, like what are you going to do? And Sean Spicer was like, I don't know. Trump's going to say something stupid. I don't know how to tell you guys how to message around when he does something dumb. I don't know how I'm going to message around when he does something dumb. But at the end of the day, you know, this will all be over in November because he's going to lose and, and then we'll never have to deal with this again. And then, obviously Trump won in 2016. And I'm like, oh my God, like the first pick, like the first person they announced that would be a part of the cabinet or not cabinet, the the White House staff was Sean Spicer. And I was like, that's not good. <laughs> that's not good because he, you know, I don't think he likes Trump very much. And now he's gone like full Trump. He's like on Newsmax and he like does all that. So I don't know. It's kind of funny. Maybe I'll cut this because I don't, 
Maybe I won't, though, because I think it's a funny story. But anyways, Sean Spicer goes on Mark Halpern a lot. And I don't know, it's kind of an interesting thing to hear how, like, Democrats and Republicans feel about different issues um, in, like, a non-threatening, like, way. Um, and, and Mark Halpern has some, like, pretty big people in there. Like, you never know who's going to show up. Like, Meghan McCain will go sometimes. Um, I really like it. But what I find really interesting when they pull up, like, regular voters, not operatives. And this is another thing, too, when we talk about, like, the issues. Because I think we just saw a poll that came out that Kamala's polling dead even with Trump on, like, how they would each handle the economy. Every Democrat in my comments on TikTok that I hear on Mark Halperin, that I see on Twitter, they're all focused on, like, existential issues. And every Republican I hear talk about things that are, like, bread and butter kitchen table issues. What I mean by this is the Republicans I hear, they talk about like what's happening to their 401k, their wage growth, their tax rate, their um, just feeling about the economy, inflation, how much groceries are costing them, how much their like housing is costing them. They want to buy a home. They're not, a, they're not sure if they'll be able to afford one. That's what the, uh, immigration, that's another thing that they talk about. I guess that can like kind of teeter into a, an existential issue, but they're concerned about, like, are illegal immigrants voting? All of the Democrats voted against the SAVE Act. What is that? You know, um, they'll talk about, especially people who live in the South, they'll talk about, like, immigration being a big issue. Versus Democrats, when I hear them talk, every single Democrat that I listened to today, I didn't hear the whole thing, they came up and they talked about abortion in January 6th. So this woman, like, I'm not trying to sound rude here, but this woman who's clearly in menopause is like, well, reproductive rights is my top issue. Ma'am, I, I don't think you're at risk of getting pregnant anymore, you know? And if you say it's for your daughter, okay, so you want your daughter to be able to get an abortion, but you're not really scared about her going for a run and getting murdered by, like, a, a criminal who happens to be illegal, like in the case of Lincoln Riley? Like, there are bigger issues for young women who then then just abortion and i say that as a childless cat lady in my 20s okay my cat's right here next to me so i mean like like i'm not trying to sound like again like this isn't me telling democrats to like feel a certain different way about an issue but my point here is that or like um they talk about january 6th like okay january 6th happened ultimately though trump left office so like this, like, oh my God, he's just going to come over and take over. Well, like we've already seen by, based on the evidence that like January 6th was awful and happened, but he also left office. So what is going, like, I just, I wonder if those existential, again, like I would argue that all Democrat issues that they really focus on over the last few years, with the exception of like maybe gay marriage, are all existential issues. I've had friends who are super pro-choice, who volunteer at Planned Parenthood and stuff, who say like, they're sick of Democrats being like messaging to them over and over again about abortion because like why don't they just do something about it? Um, climate change is another big one when people talk about like well climate change is going to kill you and it's like there's no tangible way to even see if anything we do about climate change has any effect on the environment. Like there's no way to know it, because it, because the climate doesn't exist in a vacuum and whatever we do to combat climate change and whatever Europe does is going to be offset by China and India. And they're not, they're not cutting back. Let me tell you. So it's like this existential, well, you are, you're going to do this about climate change. And it's like, but there's no way to even tell it. Like, it's not something that like you can contain yourself. It's not, it's not tangible. It's not a grocery bill. Right. And maybe that just speaks to like base issues versus independent issues. I don't know what that is. I don't understand. It's just an observation I had today because every republic again, every Republican I talk to is just like groceries are expensive. Every Democrat I talk to is like abortion, climate change, January 6th. I just won. I, I don't know. I'm a Republican, so I, I'm going to think differently, I guess. But it's a kind of a weird one. Have you noticed that too? comment below if you have? But I think I said it was going to, going to be a short episode and we're at 26 minutes, so I'm sorry. Um, this week is the, like, episode five of the True Crime Don't Waste This Fucking Podcast with Megan Stoner. Please tune into that. And otherwise, we'll hear from you tomorrow. Pray for Israel. If there's going to be a big attack tonight, please pray for them. Um, and, yeah, have a great rest of your day. Talk. An Excelsior Studios original production. April 26, 2023 was a normal day for most in the suburbs of Indianapolis, but it was shaping up to be a very bad day for 25-year-old Megan Stoner. 
who was notified of a warrant out for her arrest. Nine charges for corrupt business influence fraud where the loss is between $750 and $50,000 and theft. And unfortunately for Megan, she would not be navigating her newfound legal troubles in private. Because a community of hundreds who had been quietly watching her for years was assembling on the internet to discuss their experiences with her, which ranged from bizarre to dangerous to outright criminal, arguably worse than what Megan had been charged with. Basically what she did was emotionally um, manipulated and I'll say abused even me for about nearly these 10 years. And like, she will suck you dry any inch you give her. She just takes them out. Like Google number after Google number, you block the one, She's not done yet. She's going to get that last mm -hmm. word. The second you let her in, she takes over. And I mean, I would wake up to 20, 30, 40 notifications. I mean, she was scrolling back through things from my high school. She's a dangerous human being. And the strangest thing of all is as her case unfolded, she continued to interact with this online community, which she called her haters which was made up of business owners she had scammed, politicos from throughout the country that she had solicited for donations, a network of evangelical pastors located outside of the United States, a local brigade of moms who had called out her antics in Facebook groups for years, and even a sex shaman ended up coming together to solve crimes that she had not yet been caught for and were able to catch her after she ran from the police for a month and finally put her in jail. So how did this self-described political consultant, mental health advocate, teacher, and sexual assault survivor get into this mess in the first place? And how much of her story that she had told of herself on social media for years was actually true that's what we'll explore here every thursday on don't waste this fucking podcast the story of megan stoner